And so welcome to the panel of responses to the gender-based to gender-based violence in the Trump era. And yes, yes, we are in the Trump era. And the Trump administration's actions so far show the vulnerability of protections from abuse from abuse, from poverty, from so many other other things. And of course, this was an election cycle that featured a video of Trump boasting about sexually assaulting women and revealed that over 20 gender discrimination lawsuits had been filed against him. And dozens of women made these reports spanning multiple decades documenting our president using his power, wealth, and celebrity status to degrade and take advantage of women, publicly and privately, while proclaiming nobody respects women more than I do. Um, one of the Trump transition team's first acts was to order the State Department to submit details of programs and jobs that, quote, promote gender equality, such as ending gender-based violence, immediately sparking fears of a witch hunt that all of all such jobs, positions, and programs would be eliminated. And indeed, that first proposed budget eliminated all 25 grant programs under VAWA, totaling $48 million. And while different people in this room might differ in terms of how fu federal funds and any state-supported funds should be spent, the idea of eliminating any services and denying the existence of the problem is truly problematic and dangerous. And in his first two months in office, it's only been a couple months so far, President Trump quickly took multiple other actions that are really assaults on women's rights and that impede gender equality. So week one, the global, the global gag rule, choosing Tom Price to leave the Department of Health and, Ho Health and Human Services, who believes maternity leave should be optional, on the Syrian refugee ban on women and children. Uh, so, so the Syrian refugee ban and then what's happening right now um, in terms of, of war, where although most Syrian refugees are women and children, Trump issued that refugee ban under the pretense that Syrian refugees may be male ISIS terrorists in disguise. And of course, as we're now entering Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we celebrate and acknowledge that month with him starting out by defending Bill O'Reilly. So there's a lot, there's a lot for us to discuss. And I intentionally put this panel right before lunch so that we can continue our conversations over food in fresh air. Um, and so, and I'll say just a little follow up on, on the budget. So this, this initial budget that's come out, you know, maybe some of us breathed a sigh of relief. The domestic violence programs weren't cut. But that's not good enough because his policies and budget are exacerbating poverty, prejudice, and other harms while limiting access to rights. And when you look at the, the threats to Legal Services Corporation, and we know that rights are not self-enforcing, and lawyers have proven themselves to be more useful than ever in the last couple of months. And so really a theme for today is that this movement against gender-based violence must align and partner with other movements to fight structural conditions that reinforce and entrench family violence. So we're gonna explore this in different ways. Now Michelle Goodwin, my colleague, was planning to be here but was needing to be, now needing to be in New York for a Planned Parenthood board meeting. Nothing going on there. Um, and so, so she has recorded a six minute video for us um, where, where she was planning to address sexual coercion and sexual assault, and we're gonna be playing that. And then we'll hear from Carrie Bettinger Lopez, who we are so thrilled is here, joined by Casey. And this is this is really the way that we do it. <laughs> and she's a White House advisor. <laughs> and you know that she was a White House advisor on violence against women from March 2015 until January 2017. And is a professor at the University of Miami School of Law where she directs the Human Rights Clinic. And she'll be sharing some insights from her time in the White House and ideas for adv advocacy going forward. And I'm just doing all the introductions right now so then we can just move through. And Jennifer Coe is an amazing local resource here along with Julie Marzouk on immigration relief and remedies and advocacy. And Jennifer Coe is a professor at Western State College of Law at Argosy University where she directs the immigration clinic. And I'll speak briefly to some of the immigration concerns that are of such critical importance right now. And then Elizabeth McDowell, professor at William S. Boyd School of Law, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and director of the Family Justice Clinic, speaking to the vulnerability of LGBT protections and the ongoing need and increasing need for access to justice. So we're gonna start out with Michelle's six minute video, and then we're gonna turn to Carrie. Thank you all. 
Hello, my name is Michelle Goodwin. I'm a Chancellor's Professor at the University of California, Irvine, and also Director of our Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy, and our fabulous initiative, the Reproductive Justice Initiative. I am really sorry that I'm not able to be with you today at this very important conference, but I do want to celebrate and acknowledge my incredible colleague, Jane Stover, for the amazing work that she has done to bring the issues of domestic violence to the forefront and to place it front and center at a meeting such as this. In the United States, up until just a couple decades ago, it was permissible, legal, for a husband to rape his wife. And here we're talking about instances that even include when the husband and wife have been separated, when divorce papers have been filed, that husbands have been able to kidnap and then rape their estranged wives and not be criminally punished for doing so with judges citing rape immunity laws or marital rape laws that immunize husbands from any kind of criminal liability or guilt when doing so. But it's also important to note what this means also in the lives of girls too, because it's also been within the space of our judiciary that it's been permissible for fathers to rape their daughters and then be immune from suit as well within the space of parental immunity laws. Famous cases like Roller v. Roller um, help to help us to understand, or maybe not understand it, but certainly provide evidence of this within American jurisprudence. And it's important to note that those aren't just simply uh, this sort of draconian old, but actually it's been made new and real again. Just months ago in Montana, a judge threw out a plea deal that a father had, a father who had serially raped his daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, serially over and over again over years. That father had taken a plea deal of 25 years. That 25 years was less than the 75 years that otherwise he could have served upon conviction. So he took a 25-year plea deal, and Judge McKeon in Montana just a few months ago threw that out and said, well, this father would be missed by his children, particularly his sons. So his solution was to throw out the agreement that this father had made with the prosecutors, which had been signed, and instead, Judge McKeon sentenced the father to only 60 days in jail. And in fact, it was only 43 days in jail because he had already been in jail 17 days, right? So these are the issues that are important, not just for thinking about historical times, but rooted in the present day. I mean, we just have to take the trek up to Stanford to think about then what campus rape means in the case of Brock Turner and Judge Persky um, feeling sympathy for this young man where Brock Turner, convicted of three felony counts of sexual assault, ends up serving what ends up amounting to basically a boot camp sentence to just three months in a local jail. So there are ways in which the state can be complicit uh, in the subordination, the subjugation, the violence against women and girls. And it's really important in this meeting that attention is paid to that. So in my final minutes, here's what I want uh, to put on the table for us. I want for us to think about the ways in which domestic violence gets escalated in pregnancy because it does. And I want us to think about the ways in which we need gun reform because a woman is far more likely to die in her home when there is a gun and she has been the victim of domestic violence. But I also want us to think about the ways in which the state can also further undermine women's rights. There are some states that have floated gag rule laws that would prevent a doctor from asking a woman whether or not there is a gun in the home when she has been a victim of domestic violence. Does that make any sense? I mean, of course it doesn't, but these are the kinds of issues that we need to pay attention to. We also need to pay attention to the ways in which the state can be violent against women too, as such as 
in cases where women are being prosecuted for conduct during their pregnancy where they need medical care and they don't need jailing and shackling and prosecutions by the state. And here I'm talking about cases of pregnant women like Bebe Shui attempting suicide during pregnancy and the state of Indiana prosecuting her for attempted first degree murder. That makes absolutely no sense. Or the cases in which a pregnant woman in Iowa falls down the steps during her pregnancy and the state seeks to prosecute her saying, well, this was just a botched attempt at an abortion. Well, that absolutely makes no sense. Or the way in which other aspects of that kind of intersection between the state and medicine gets involved in very pernicious ways in women's pregnancies, such as women being threatened with arrest if they refuse a C-section, when we know that the U.S. does three times the amount of healthy C-sections, right? That's according to the World Health Organization. So at this conference, while so many important issues are being unpacked, I think that it's absolutely terrific that we can diversify how we think about domestic violence, how we understand the urgency of thinking about domestic and family violence in these times, and how we can think about those issues and the unique ways in which they land in pregnant women's lives or in the reproductive sphere of women's lives. Hi, I'm Carrie Bettinger Lopez. This is baby Casey. <laughs> Um, Casey comes with me everywhere because he doesn't like a bottle and because it's just fun to take him everywhere and it's actually incredibly empowering and a great, great feeling to have a baby up here. So I'm going to try my best, but I have this like amazing cadre of sisters here in the audience and on the panel who can help me out if Casey decides he wants to speak up. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so thanks so much for having me. Um, I am a law professor at University of Miami School of Law with my wonderful colleague Donnie, Donna Koger, and um, and I just finished a position as White House advisor on violence against women, where I was uh, an advisor at the White House uh, to the the president and the vice president and the senior advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, um, and. My job there was really interesting. I, I felt like I was kind of the least likely of people to be selected for that position because I came in as a strong advocate of the US government. A lot of, of course, the critiques that are being levied today were ones that I've made um, principally in international human rights fora. And, um, and I've done a lot of work kind of thinking about framing uh, uh, you know, institutional responses or lack thereof to domestic and sexual violence as a human rights violation um, in the United States. And so I came in and uh, it was, you know, was baffled while I was there and continue to be, but also it was an incredible experience. So I want to take a couple moments to just reflect on some of the lessons that I learned there as an advocate from inside and now coming back outside. Um, and I also want to just acknowledge a wonderful colleague of mine who uh, was at the White House with me, Kaylin Crockett, um, who is an, uh, a S Southern California native, and, uh, but has come here from DC. She works at Health and Human Services right now and is championing uh, so many of the programs that we are talking about today. And so Kaylin is an example of a change agent within the federal government, and you all should pick her brain today because there are many people who are career feds like Kalen um, who are very concerned about the issues we're talking today and, and I want to make sure that that, that that message is is made clear to everybody because um, you know we may be working with a new administration but it doesn't mean there aren't amazing people within the federal government who are continuing uh, to take a very strong nuanced and thoughtful approach to the issues we're talking about today. Um, so. So I just want to talk for a moment about um, the Obama-Biden White House. Um, it was a very different and special place uh, for social justice advocates, um, and especially those who are working to end gender violence. It was not perfect by any means, um, and I think many of the presentations today have highlighted some of the gaps that remained before, during, and after. Um, but you know, compared to where we are right now, it feels like kind of fuzzy kittens and baby seals. Uh, <laughs> So, so I want to just kind of take a moment to reflect a little bit on, on, on some of the things that I was engaged in there um, and then kind of turn the lens over to where we're at right now. 
Yes, Casey, I know. Um, okay, so generally, there was really a primacy placed um, during the administration, I think, and others may take issue with this statement, but I think there was really a primacy placed on, um, on holding ourselves accountable for creating change. I mean, from the beginning, Obama said to advocates, um, you are going to be responsible for holding me accountable. I'm a community organizer, and I know the value of pressure from outside. And I think a lot of advocates took that to heart. I think many people, including myself, didn't fully know kind of how to operationalize that, and I've learned a lot about, about that since. Um, but, uh, but specifically on the Violence Against Women front, we had this incredible champion, and uh, again, I know that some folks may kind of take issue with, with this, but we had an incredible champion in the vice president, right? This was a vice president who, when asked to be the president's running mate, um, when the president asked him to be his running mate, he said, I'll do so on two conditions. The first being that I'm the last guy in the room when important decisions are being made, and the second being that there's an advisor on violence against women in the White House, because that was the primacy that he afforded to that issue. Come on, Casey. I may need to hand him off. Okay. Um, so, um, so, you know, and as an advocate who takes a critical eye, oh, my, my my sisters are all here. Okay. Um, <laughs> why don't I give them to Lee so she can walk okay. amply, but thank you, Jane. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, the number of accomplishments that we had on the Violence Against Women front was really, truly remarkable. Um, and I just want to kind of comment on a few of those because it can help to ground our conversation about places that there were gaps, um, and, but places that we need to fill and focus on now. We had the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2013. Others have mentioned this. Um, we had, and I'll talk about it in a moment more. The redefinition, redefinition of rape in the Uniform Crime Reporting Program. The White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault, which has been described and discussed. Um, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, which put over $80 million towards the testing of rape kits and improvement of the criminal justice response. We had uh, something that I had worked on heavily before the administration and, and during, which was the, uh, the promulgation of guidance on gender-biased policing from the Department of Justice, and uh, I believe over $10 million in grants that actually went out to implement that, that guidance um, through different uh, 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 experimental programs with police departments. We established a North American working group on uh, violence against indigenous women and had the three attorney generals of all three countries in North America, Canada, the US, and Mexico, um, come together to emphasize the importance of focusing on that critical issue. We had an executive order requiring that all federal agencies develop domestic violence workplace policies. We had real enforcement by the departments of education and housing um, of civil rights laws in the gender violence arena, unprecedented amounts in the federal budget for violence against women programming. Um, and so this was an administration that despite major gaps, um, and I was a fierce critic from within, uh, as I was from the outside, um, this was an administration that put its money where its mouth was in many respects. Um, and so, so I want to kind of stop there as a point of departure and now shift the lens to talk for a moment just about um, the state of funding, legislation, and policy making related to violence against women in our current uh, situation. And thanks, Jane, for putting this together. It's um, not the most... Uh, uh, lively or, or, or uh, optimistic. I, I'm not incredibly optimistic, of course, um, and, uh, but you know, we have to have this conversation um, about anticipated threats that so many folks are talking about um, by, uh, that are posed to the, uh, by this administration to, to funding for core victim services um, as well as legislation that authorizes these programs. And to be clear, right now when I'm talking about those programs, I'm talking primarily about kind of what we might call the holy trinity of, of uh, programs which have been referred to, and Mimi's presentation was incredibly uh, useful here, looking at uh, the Violence Against Women Act, which of course was uh, first passed in 94 and has been reauthorized um, three times since, um, the Victims of Crime Act, and the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, or FIPSA. Um, and, and I'll talk in a moment about those, but um, you know, 
many of us have heard rumors that the Trump White House was considering adopting the Conservative Heritage Foundation's blueprint uh, for balance, a federal budget for 2017. And amongst the many drastic measures in that Heritage Foundation blueprint, um, it called for the elimination of VAWA grants, quote unquote, saving $480 million in 2017. And the next page of that proposal also called for the elimination of the Legal Services Corporation, uh, saving $393 million. And more on that in a moment. Um, so, so I'd like to just provide a little bit of reassurance, some strategic advice and words of caution on the state of federal support for victim services. Um, I'll also address some of the warning signs that are communicated through the president's budget and f to what extent I can offer my insight on how to read the tea leaves if such a thing is possible in this administration. So first, VAWA. Um, Funding uh, for VAWA in 2017 was nearly $500 million, as I said, and we know that that, amongst other things, provides uh, for critical services for domestic violence and sexual assault survivors. And most of this, and many of you know this, take, comes in the form of grants that are administered by the Office on Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice. Uh, Attorney General Sessions has stated a priority to address violent crime in the United States and is spearheading a DOJ task force on reducing violent crime in America. And so when we speak with, frankly, with colleagues at OVW and um, folks in the DC Beltway who are working on uh, VAWA issues, um, while there was initial uh, serious concern about the VAWA grants uh, being eliminated and uh, the Heritage Foundation blueprint being adopted, I think generally we're actually going to see um, general support for VAWA and the mission for OVW, the mission of OVW. Um, it's unlikely that the office will have the same level of influence as under the Obama administration, and particularly under the leadership of B. Hansen, who was its last director and did an incredible job. Um, and we won't see that level of, of, of focus on shaping public policy, using an intersectional approach to supporting survivors, um, and especially those from marginalized communities. Um, but I don't think that we should be concerned that funding will be eliminated altogether. Uh, it's by the authority of Congress that OVW was established, and it's Congress that will be re responsible for re reauthorizing VAWA in 2018. And national advocates are already meeting with key Senate staff about this right now, who are reassuring them that VAWA will not be harmed, kind of over my dead body types of comments that we're hearing, um, and that the work has already begun on VAWA 18. Um, and so I just have a quick slide um, here. This is a letter, a bipartisan letter, um, that was sent to the president um, a month or so ago um, from a you know, bipartisan group, um, you see Grassley and Leahy on the, on the signature lines there, kind of emphasizing the importance of VAWA, their, their support for VAWA. But I highlighted this language um, from the bottom of the letter, uh, which, you know, for what it's worth, and again, for tea leaf reading, the victims of these crimes can include children and teenagers, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and native women, amongst others. Um, we see uh, who is not mentioned in this list, um, so several of the populations that have been mentioned in this room today that are the most hot button issues of this administration, LGBT people, undocumented immigrants, public housing residents. Those were three groups of folks that were, uh, that were prioritized in VAWA 13 and didn't make it to this list. But at the same time, we have to remain vigilant. Um, as I was saying, um, we have to uh, focus on areas where VAWA 13 made so much progress. So these populations, as well as um, the folks that, the populations that I just mentioned. Um, and, and while there may be disagreement in this room about this, my position is that um, given the polit political reality of the moment, that if we can salvage VAWA 13 as a baseline, uh, that that would be a, a victory, um, that we should be thinking very, uh, very strategically at this moment um, about any expansion of, of VAWA, any kind of, any tinkering with, uh, with its focus, um, because if we don't uh, get if, if, if a straight up reauthorization is not what Congress is grappling with, there could be a lot of tinkering that waters down significantly some of the important gains that we made in 13. And I would love to have a conversation further about that. 
you may have also heard this week uh, some other news. Uh, um, several members of the House of Representatives announced a new bipartisan task force to end sexual violence. And they've said that it will be focusing on addressing sexual violence in the military, on college campuses, rape kit backlogs, law enforcement training, and cyber harassment. The White House has shown no signs that they are going to have another advisor on violence against women, nor a council on women and girls. Uh, and so um, having this congressional task force could potentially be an important way of establishing bipartisan support for this issue um, from a different branch of government. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I say that with lots of hesitation, and we will kind of see where that leads. But that's an interesting development that we've seen this week. And given the gap in the executive branch, there are potentially opportunities there. Um, I just want to focus for a minute on VOCA, the Victims of Crime Act, and FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, for a moment. Um, neither of those were identified in the president's budget as programs to cut. So that's um, interesting in and of itself. I'm not sure that anybody is even aware that those programs exist, um, right? So there's. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and so this brings me to just a, a more general point, and then I want to wrap it up. Um, the lack of specificity in certain areas of the Trump budget, um, some programs might appear to be quote unquote safe, as I just mentioned, VOCA or FIPSA or VAWA, um, because they were unnamed uh, and not targeted for elimination. But this dramatic reduction in overall agency spending that we see in the budget is what we really need to be scared about. Um, this so-called skinny budget, right, if enacted, will inevitably require significant scaling back of programs across the departments uh, that provide essential services for survivors. So for example, the Trump budget calls for, calls for an 18% reduction in spending at HHS. It calls, uh, excuse me, that, that equals $15.1 billion less than the authorized budget for 2017. At the Department of Ed, it's 13% scale back, or $9 billion. And at the Department of Justice, it's a 3.8% scale back, or $1.1 billion less than 2017 authorization. Um, and so with FIPSA, for example, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, that's, that's a grant-making program that's around $150 million a year anyway. It's peanuts. It goes to fund domestic violence shelters and state coalitions across the country. Um, and, uh, and FIPSA provides federal dollars to more than 1,600 domestic violence programs across the U.S. in each of the 50 states and in each of the U.S. territories and tribes. Local programs depend on FIPSA funds for approximately 10% of their overall operational budget. So we can imagine the impact that such a vast blow to the HHS and DOJ budgets would have on the limited federal dollars that trickle down to these local programs, resulting in less support going to state domestic violence and sexual assault coalitions, rape crisis centers, DV shelters, to name only a few. Um, and so regardless of whether these, these uh, sources of funding are specifically named or not, the overall program cuts um, to the departments are going to be hugely devastating. Um, the National Network to End Domestic Violence has estimated that if the cuts that are, were applied across the board, um, as opposed to targeting programs individually, um, uh, are applied, approximately 260,000 fewer victims would be able to access shelters and supportive services each year. Um, and, uh, and, and just a final uh, couple thoughts just to close. The President's bu budget is a moral document. Uh, it articulates th where the White House seeks to preserve, reduce, or increase funding, um, and therefore really reflects the values of our current occupant of the White House. Um, we should be deeply concerned by these across-the-board cuts, um, and, but we should be reassured that, in the end, Congress determines the budget. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing our advocacy at the local level to make sure our local elected leaders know, and meeting with them in their local offices is a very effective way of making your voice heard. Because we need to make no mistake that the dramatic and sweeping nature of the cuts to programs we know are critical lifelines to vulnerable communities, as well as to as the proposed elimination of entire offices and, uh, and independent agencies, that this is an intentional tactic to demonstrate power and control. Much like an abuser, the Trump administration uses intimidation to create a climate of fear, 
And we need to know that this, that's what ultimately this budget is all about. By putting these multiple programs and corresponding issue areas on a chopping block, the budget is daring progressives to di be divided and disorganized. How can we argue that, for example, preserving the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness on the one hand is more important than rallying against the proposed elimination of legal services uh, corporation funding? The answer is we can't and we shouldn't and uh, because we know that survivors and, the and their families when we work with them, it's not just one, but m multiple federal programs and their relevant systems that our clients and communities depend on. Um, and just in closing, I want to highlight a couple of those programs, the things that you all know, but the general public does not necessarily associate with, uh, with gender violence. As I mentioned, the Legal Services Corporation, that's a federal nonprofit funds free legal, civil legal assistance for low-income individuals. More than 70% of clients of LSC-funded programs are women, and almost a third of their cases involve family law. Research has shown, and many of you know this, that access to legal services uh, is the most significant cause of a dramatic decrease in domestic violence in the 1990s. That's up for debate as well, but that's what many, much research has shown. And when victims have lawyers, they can get tangible help, like an order of protection, child support, uh, safe custody or visitation arrangements, um, and ultimately a divorce. Uh, if that's what they choose, um, while also accessing social services. The 21st Century Community uh, Learning Centers Program at the Department of Ed is another program that's at risk, uh, that supports before and after school programs, as well as summer programs, uh, which enable, for example, uh, survivors to access ch child care. At HHS, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program subsidizes costs for heating uh, for families at or below the poverty line. Um, $4.2 billion in the, in, the, in the budget, in the President's budget, um, worth of programming by the Community Services Block Grant through HHS, which administers emergency food assistance and employment services. And then there's the Community Development Block Grant Program administered by HUD, which provides support to states and municipalities to create affordable housing. So, um, yes, it's not particularly, uh, I, I have no um, words to uplift us, but, um, but I do hope that, um, that, that this information, for what it's worth, can help us to kind of frame our advocacy when we're speaking with our local elected officials, um, when we're speaking with DVSA organizations um, to think through kind of this big picture. I think folks in the Beltway sometimes zone in on that holy trinity of, uh, of, um, of, of legislation, uh, VOCA, FIPSA, and VAWA, as kind of the be all end all. And sometimes we lose the forest for the trees and we need to kind of see the ways in which these, uh, th this budget has such an overarchingly devastating effect uh, on survivors and, on, um, and, and for advocacy groups that are, that are seeking to hold institutions and government accountable. So thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. So my name is Jennifer Coe. Thank you, Carrie, for that was really informative and helpful, even, um, even if the climate that we're in is not particularly uplifting. So I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about immigration. And I thought what I would do first is emphasize a couple of things that we have known to be true for a long time, irrespective of who's sitting in the White House. Um, some of those things include the fact that immigration harms and the fear of deportation have long exacerbated existing gender-based violence in communities across America, and that attacks on particular communities, whether they come from local policing strategy or at the national level or from social and cultural narratives, um, have created additional stressors on gender-based violence and have and de tend to deepen existing cycles of power and control, tend to discourage people from reporting abuse um, for fear of placing an already vulnerable community um, under attack and whatnot. And we know that the immigration laws have long been, uh, played an uncomfortable role at times in deepening this dynamic by increasing fears of deportation and increasing dependence um, on abusive actors. Um, but for the so past several decades, 
um, and through congressional laws. Uh, domestic violence and under other gender-based advocates have been able to make use of exceptions in the immigration laws. And these exceptions, things like the U visa, which Natalie talked about, have been created specifically for survivors of crime, for domestic violence, sexual assault, um, and so that in immigration practice, the existence of domestic violence, the existence of past victimization has tended to operate as a little glimmer of hope in people's cases um, and in a legal landscape that otherwise offers so little recourse either for legalization or for defenses to deportation. In some ways, one could say that they've also arguably deepened existing discourses around good immigrants and bad immigrants, and that's certainly, um, you know, also sort of part of the dynamic. But you know, as a result, because of these um, congressional avenues for immigration relief that are based on uh, domestic violence victim status or, or past sexual assaults or other gender-based violence, attorneys and advocates in this space have been able to carve out narrow niche, niches of practice, um, you know, generally focusing on representation of immigrant victims, of immigrant survivors, seeking remedies under the Violence Against Women Act, under the U visas, federal funding has been available, and funders have often supported this tendency to specialize in victim-specific remedies um, and waivers. And this has been a valuable contribution, offering many um, individuals who have been subjected to gender-based violence ways to legalize their status, avoid their undocumented um, status, and avoid deportation and detention. But I think in this climate, while valuable, those existing efforts are incomplete and also unclear as to how much support they, there will be for them to begin with. And the reason I say that is that, as we all know, this administration has, while cutting funding in many other areas, increased and in boosting funding to essentially attack, wage an all-out war against immigrants and immigrant communities. So it's a whole new ball game, even for, it, for people who have been traditionally working um, with immigrant survivors and victims of crime. On one hand, these forms of relief that I've mentioned that have been created by statute, things like the U visa, things like remedies under VAWA or gender-based asylum claims, those things themselves are not going to go away because unless Congress were to act, um, which you know, we haven't yet gotten there. Um, and it's unclear whether the administration will change their actual interpretation of the law and implementation. All that is certainly a possibility and not something that I would put past this administration. But even in the very early months, we're only a couple of months in, a couple of trends have become clear. And I think one thing that has become clear is that this administration essentially has no limits on its willingness to deploy immigration enforcement taxes, tactics that specifically create fear, that are intended to create fear, that will certainly and already have had the effect of discouraging victims of all kinds of crime, including gender-based violence, from coming forward and making use of available legal and other remedies, and that any kind of exceptionalism that might have previously existed for immigrant victims and survivors of gender-based violence, however sort of problematic they might have been, are going to be essentially watered down and may not have the same kind of effect that they might have been. And so there are all kinds of examples, small and large. There are the small examples that populate the media, um, things like domestic violence victim being picked up um, by ICE while at a courthouse seeking a protective order, domestic violence victims being deported after years of being told that they were not a priority despite pending U visa cases. There are already the reported uh, decreases in cities like Los Angeles and Houston of domestic violence-based calls, specifically from Latino communities. Um, there are also larger policy shifts and also the narratives that this administration is creating things like um, uh, calling for the expansion of 287G agreements, which would call on local police to enter into partnerships with ICE. Um, there are fathers everywhere being detained by ICE. There are mothers everywhere being detained by ICE. There are entire communities being singled out as dangerous and therefore banned by the federal government. And I think in an example that, I, that really best illustrates 
you know, it well illustrates this conference theme, the politicization of safety is the administration's creation of the voice office, of an office that's designed specifically to elevate and prioritize the safety of only those crime victims where the perpetrators have been undocumented immigrants. And so I think the result of all of this is that um, those concerned with gender-based violence, specifically in the immigration context, I think the bottom line is that we all need to become not just gender-based violence immigration advocates, but immigration advocates and deportation defense advocates. So let me just sketch out a couple of quick um, ideas for solutions, which are all sort of related. One has already been mentioned. I think the current climate really highlights the need for state and local interventions, whether it comes from state and local government, speaking out against courthouse policies, resisting 287G agreements, calling for states and cities to fund universal representation in detention and deportation work. I think there are opportunities for those who have been working traditionally in domestic violence specific spaces and immigration to forge more boldly into deportation defense um, because that is the area where legal representation and advocacy is the most isolated and underserved. For private funders, I think there are more opportunities to move away from relief-based funding and into creative and more nimble lawyering and advocacy strategies. Um, there are opportunities and also a need for more extensive collaboration between lawyers and organizers for multi-tiered strategies involving media, grassroots campaigns, community mobilization, and even civil, civil disobedience. And my hope is in, in a, with greater collaboration between domestic violence spaces and immigration um, advocacy organizing, that could also lead to greater opportunities to raise questions about gender-based dynamics within community organizing spaces. Um, and I guess I would last conclude that there is still a need and an urgency to maintain hope, to maintain moral outrage, and to do so in a way that critiques a broader system and to question the legitimacy of the deportation machine that is currently existing and having a devastating impact on immigrant and other communities across America. Thank you. Oh, okay. Can you hear me better? Yeah. All right. Did you hear what I said before? Sort of, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start with my, I think I'm gonna echo some of what other people, a lot of what other people have said actually. Um, but I'm going to start with my working definition of gender-based violence, um, which um, in this context is really any violence that's rooted in gender-based inequality and discrimination. And so as others have touched on, that really includes um, obviously family viol violence within families, right, and between intimate partners, but also violence that's experienced in the larger community where people live and work and go to school and, and engage in other activities. And it's also violence from state actors, such as law enforcement and the legal system. Um, so I also wanted to briefly, and we've touched on this a little bit um, with other presenters, but touch on the incidence of intimate partner violence and other forms of violence in the LGBT community um, because it's, um, our ideas of gender violence are very rooted in, in the concept of heterosexual relationships and violence within those relationships. So um, as others have noted, including the speaker last night and speakers today, um, their research on intimate partner violence, with, um, the studies I looked at include cohabitating couples and also a lifetime incidence of violence indicate that especially lesbians and bisexual and transgender people have some t um, in some studies dramatically higher rates of violence within um, than people who don't identify as trans or people in heterosexual relationships. And at least one study showed much higher rates for um, gay men as well. Um, hate crimes are also um, and data about hate crimes are also a source of information about the types of violence experienced um, among the LGBT individuals that is gender-based. Um, FBI data from 2014, for example, 
showed that over 20% of LGBT individuals were victims of what are called single bias hate crimes. So hate crimes that are designated as occurring based on one um, identity category. Um, and that was actual or perceived uh, sexual identity or gender identity. And only race-based um, hate crimes were reported at a higher, at a higher rate, um, which led the New York Times to um, include a headline on the front page that said that, um, that LGBT people were, had the, experienced the highest incident of, of hate crimes in the United States. And that information is dramatically underreported, um, not just because hate crimes are unlikely to be reported to law enforcement, but most law enforcement agencies across the country actually don't have the procedures in place to identify bias crimes and report them to the FBI. Um, but we know that there's a significant amount. And in fact, research suggests that um, violence against the LGBT community is on the rise, particularly against transgender individuals. Um, of color. So black and Hispanic transgender persons are especially at risk of violence and not only violence but lethal violence. Um, and reports indicate the violence against trans people um, are also on the, is also on the rise. The Human Rights Campaign reported that more trans people were killed in 2015 than during any other year on record and, and that doesn't appear to be just an incidence of increasing reporting, but actually increased incidence of violence. Um, so why would that be the case, and how does, and what does that suggest for the present era, <laughs> the Trump era? I don't, that's a little scary to say out loud. Um, so analysts contribute, um, <coughs> excuse me, rising um, rates of hate crimes um, in particular as part of a bash, uh, backlash effect of increasing visibility and expanding rights for LGBT people. Um, and the theory is that um, this has been threatening to people with conservative norms about um, gender and sex or who, feel, or who feel that their own social power is being diminished. Um, and in fact, we could see the Trump administration is, as related in part to a backlash uh, against the advances of, of women, of people of color, and other groups. Um, the Trump administration has had mixed messages on LGBT issues. I mean, Trump himself um, has tried at times to indicate that he would be a friend to LGBT people, um, but in fact, his administration has been um, quick to roll back some protections against, uh, or that um, had been put into place by the Obama administration. Um, so for example, on the issue of access to bathrooms of one's choice, on February 22nd, the Trump administration revoked a federal um, guideline that Obama had put into place specifying that transgender students have the right to use public school restrooms that correspond with their gender identity. Um, and a little more stealthily, on March 29th, um, Trump signed an order that weakened protections that had been signed into law by President Obama in 2014. Um, so at that time, Obama had signed an executive order banning LGBT di discrimination by federal contractors, and he had concurrently signed an order that required those contractors to report how they were, in fact, eliminating um, LGBT bi uh, bias or discrimination in hiring, firing, and promotions, and Trump eliminated that second order, um, taking the legs off of the, the first order. So the message is really that the federal government isn't interested in protecting LGBT um, individuals from discrimination. Um, in this context, I think it's also important to echo what many others have said about the importance of an intersectional analysis, because I think another important factor in the vulnerability of LGBT people to um, violence that's gender-based um, in their communities from state actors and in their um, intimate relationships is the in relative invisibility of the intersectionality of LGBT people and that that fosters gender-based violence and this is you know come up I think in ev almost every um, conversation that we've had every um, panel that we've had so far and speaker um, so LGBT people are not only 
minorities in terms of sexual orientation or gender identity, but they're also members of the immigrant communities that are under attack, right? And they're people of color, um, they're poor, actually disproportionately um, poor, particularly, that's particularly true for trans and um, lesbian and bisexual people of color. Um, and so they're members of other minority communities. And this fact was rendered relatively invisible by the marriage equality movement in particular, which prepare, uh, um, presented same-sex families as largely middle class, very, you know, other than the fact that one had a same-sex, a partner of the same sex, very heteronormative, um, and very white, and it didn't advance the economic, racial, or gender equality of LGBT people or anybody else. Um, and LGBT people, as I mentioned, also face misrecognition and poor treatment by service providers in legal and medical and other communities. Um, so what can we do now? So briefly, I just want to touch on four points. Um, most obvious from what I just said, I think, is the need for intersectional organizing and coalition building. So I would echo my um, panel mates and, and others who have spoken to that issue. So gender-based violence occurs at the intersection of racism, sexism, transphobia, xenophobia, homophobia, um, and poverty. And so we need to bring together different communities to address shared subordination and figure out and figure out action plans that address those. Um, we also need to decentralize data collection of gender-based violence um, because we really, as others have noted, don't have sufficient information about the experience of gender-based violence, and so that makes it harder to address. Um, and so one example that was just, um, I just found out about this week is that NBC and ProPublica are now tracking hate crimes. I think there's creative things that we can do to, to collect data outside of law enforcement. And I think that's really important, especially as we're trying to address alternatives to law enforcement measures to address gender violence. We also need to think hard about access to justice um, at a time when we're facing the proposed elimination of the Legal Services Corporation. Um, we, that may not happen, but it's gonna be a very difficult time to have the conversations we should be having, having about expanding access to legal resources, not only to address individual legal needs, but the need for structural reform. So we're gonna have to think hard about how we can avoid avoid eliminating representation on the hard cases, because that's already an issue. Um, it's already an issue that it's very difficult for LGBT victims of gender violence to get representation from traditional legal aid organizations or to have their needs for structural reform addressed. Um, so how can we coordinate efforts to train lawyers for pro bono um, panels, to build um, intake and referral systems, um, in the communities, out, maybe outside of traditional locations to reach people and to engage in the kind of community organizing um, that Jennifer mentioned we need to do. Um, and then last, I think we need to think creatively about shifting anti-discrimination protection strategies from the national, um, where it's not so friendly right now, to the local, um, but in a way that coordinates our efforts and keeps the national, our national allies in, in mind. Um, so maybe we can talk some more about um, those in questions. Thank you.